Thank you very much, uh, Debbie, for inviting me to speak today on this topic. And uh, I, this has been a subject that I got introduced to thanks to Debbie. Without her, I would not have even known about the uh, Willem sisters, or not Willem sisters actually, Lady Elizabeth Willem and her sister Mary Simon. So these were the two uh, women whom I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, I have been to Fort St. George, I do not know how many times. I have been to the Church of St. Mary's the same number of times as I must have been to Fort St. George because every time I go there I never miss going to the Church of St. Mary's. And right at the entrance you have the tombstone of Lady Elizabeth Williams. And I have passed it several times uh, without even bothering to pause by and to reflect on the greatness of this lady. Tamil Peser on the Avangrode, the Kakana, Moripe at the Sodre, is even the Irenda Amgile, a paint money at a Patti Uru Valla. Patamoda of the Nutrandela, couple Mudamaka, Uru Rode, another in the Vakila, a judge of Niripadia, a male part of the Nada, Angilti in the Vanda, our Uru Niripadi or a Manevio, and the Manevio or a Sabodri, Irenda paint money at Patamoda of the Nutrandela, England in the couple lay in the Vanda, and the Yoyo Shangilna. I have ordered the gay of the Kala Mudiva day. Put in the George Potter, St. Mary's and the Ramada Povil, the Ladana Sila. And the Kala Katis and Nika Parking and now Tole Pesi Kadia, or Camera Kadia, or Aeroplane Kadia, the couple lovers the car massa, England lives the Chennai car massa. And the couple Aerina, he gave us the sale home ground, guaranteed Kadia. But he never had another And the Mario. காலகட்டத்தில்ப <laughs> ஒருவேளைக்குரியதுன்னு <laughs> திரும்பி எல்லாத்தையும் வரையணும் ஆரம்பத்தில் அந்த மாதிரி கஷ்டப்பட்டு அவங்க வரைஞ்சிருக்காங்க அவங்களுடைய சென்னை வாழ்க்கை வரலாறு பற்றி தான் இந்த சொற்பொழிவு நான் பேசுகிறேன் அமங் ராஜாஸ் அண்ட் அதர் இஸ் கால்டர்ஸ் போத் ரிட்டன் பை டாக்டர் பேட்ரிக் வீலர் பேட்ரிக் வீலர் வாஸ் பார்ட் ஆஃப் த வில்லிங் ப்ராஜெக்ட் that was begun by mcgill university and in which uh, dakshin chitra was involved and thanks to dakshin chitra i got involved in that project i attended some of the talks and some of the presentations and that is when i really got to know about lady elizabeth willis in a very big way and then having read more and frankly you know ornithology is not something of my interest but i got to know about a man called john james audubon who is considered to be the first ornithologist and then i discovered that long before audubon there was a woman called lady elizabeth willem who had been an ornithologist so she in effect becomes the first ornithologist in the western world a person who studied birds and specialized in it when such a interest was practically non existent so wheeler has written two books they both books the first one ribbons among the rajas deals with english women in india before 1857 the second one a tale of two sisters is exclusively dedicated to the letters that lady elizabeth willem and her sister mary simons wrote back to their relatives in india 
and this forms the basis of this presentation. So, Rendu Putta Gadirke, one of the Ribbon Saman the Rajas, Angile appointment in Hell Patapoda Avenu, Randale, India, the Hell the Bodhi, Avanga India of the Siena, Idi is Anga, Avanga Yena Lam Patanga, Pinga the Pati of Putta. Adepola, in the Rendi Sahoda, Avanga Sene Deli, Yena Lam Kadina Kalitin Angalo, Adi Putta Hamaka Vadi. And the two are showing how they gave the Asian Ella, Kadidan, the Kirby, Avanga, Yaku, Ella, Kinka, the same, and she very good put her Mahavadi. What is very interesting is that between them, no, not between them, yeah, between them together, they wrote 155,000 words in the eight years that they were there. Urukshati, Ambati, I die, and what they had even read the very Asian Kanga, the Kadidan Ella, and the intervention. They have upper fountain pen, kadayate, ballpoint pen, kadayate, yellow name, and then the year which is now the ink, the toch, toch, the other which is now on the 80s. It's been hard work that they have actually spent, they spent their time very usefully and they have documented their life over here. Sir Henry Quillen was appointed as the judge of the, as a puny judge of the Supreme Court of Madras, Supreme Court of Judicature, Madras. So this, today we have the High Court. Preceding the High Court, we had what was known as the Supreme Court of Madras. And he was one of three judges who was officiating over here. Sir Thomas Strange was the name of the Chief Justice. And under him were Sir Henry Willett and Sir Benjamin Sullivan. These were the two, uh, two judges under the Chief Justice. So the three of them together, they administered justice to what was known as Madras City. And the court building must have existed in this place, which is the north gate of Fort St. George. Inside Fort St. George, you have not, you have, uh, let me see, you've got Watergate, St. Thomas's Gate, Balaja Gate, St. George's Gate, Middle Gate, and North Gate. So you've got six gates inside Fort St. George leading to the city of Chennai. And in North Gate, you have what is called North Street. And when we read history books, we know that the Supreme Court existed here before it shifted to Raja Ji Saleh or First Line Beach. It stood where we today have the Collectorate of Chennai, the Chennai Collector's Office where that, that is now, that is called Singara Vedar Mani. So in place of that, that is where the Supreme Court of Madras used to be. Before it went there, it used to be in this particular location. During Sir Henry Quillen's time, it was over here. And he became the judge and along with him came in 1801 Lady Elizabeth and her sister Mary Simon as I said. Even the other model model the India was given the Angile appointment in the Kadir. Angile had given the Padinea of the Mutrandela, the Ayah, the Armuthi, Mupati, Uboda, the Red, Mother Mother, Angile, the Chennai, the Uru, the Puddin, the George Porte, the Porte, Katar. Apo Angile appointment in the Kadir. Other two were after the Verdam held the parting and a wooded independent in England. But under the Kalakatri, Pentmanical, Angile Pentmanical, wooded independent, Israel Kanga, and the Namaki, the river is enough. India would be a Mudal Mudal Angile Kal, Nenevi Kal, Adavu, and the Samadhi in a Yoguru, Adakam say they had a Sumer for the Kal, that is a tombstone. The first inscribed tombstone in India belonging to the British is of a woman and her name was Elizabeth Baker and it is in Fort St. George in the church of St. Mary's. It is broken as you can see in several pieces and it has been assembled like a jigsaw puzzle and it has been placed over there in the yard of St. Mary's. This was a woman who died in childbirth in the ship just off the coast of Madras. Her husband was the captain and then the body was brought to Madras city and she was buried over here. So Elizabeth Baker is really the first woman and the first tombstone, British tombstone in the whole of India. So we have had instances of it. Then, you know, what happened was that the English were initially marrying the Portuguese women in San Tome. Thereafter, English women began coming one by one to India in search of husbands. It was very clearly documented that any woman who did not have a fortune of her own, a woman who did not have a family that could take care of her, was put on ships 
and sent out to India. Because they were assured of getting married within the first two weeks of landing over here. There was, the ratio was 200 is to 1. 200 Englishmen to one woman who was landing. And such was the level of desperation that these women were known as the fishing fleet. They came here to fish for husbands. And if the woman had not got married at the end of the first two weeks, there was something wrong with her. If she didn't get married at the end of one month, there was something seriously wrong. If she was not married at the end of one year, she was unmarriable and she would have to go back to England, come back to some other British station after one or two years and try her luck. But there was one woman who did not get married for two years, stayed on, then got married, then became a very close friend of the governor of Madras, became the first businesswoman of India. And that was a woman called Catherine Nix. She, was, she lived here for two years without getting married, something seriously wrong. She wanted to marry Elihu Yale, who was rising higher and higher in the official dumb in Madras. But he had already set his eyes on the wife of the man who was second in command in the court and that man was clearly dying. So Yale was biding his time when he could marry that lady. So Yale got Catherine Nix, or as she was known, Catherine Barker at that time. He got Catherine Barker married to his closest friend, John Nix. Thereafter, Mrs. Nix and Mr. Yale became a business partnership together. And all of Yale's corruption was funneled into Mrs. Nix's business entity. And she managed this business on the governor's behalf. So this is what, you know, very interesting lives in the 17th century of which we know nothing. And the Kalakattas Gavandi, Yeranu Rangiri Erkani Kirtanana, Oreyu Rangiri Erkani Kirtanana, Oreyu Rangiri Erkani Kirtanana. In England, the couple of them are not going to be able to get the government. Why are they going to be able to get the government? Why are they going to be able to get the government? Why are they going to be able to get the government? அதனால லண்டன்ல என்ன பண்ணுவாங்க அவங்களுக்கு குடும்பத்துல சொத்து இல்லையோ பணம் இல்லையோ அப்பா அம்மா இல்ல அப்படின்னா அவங்கள ஒரு கப்பல்ல ஏத்தி சென்னைக்கு அனுப்பிச்சிடுவாங்க நீங்க அங்க போங்க உங்களுக்கு ரெண்டு நாள்ல ஒரு கணவர் கிடைச்சிடுவாரு அவங்களோட நீங்க சந்தோஷமா திருமணம் பண்ணிட்டு இருங்க அப்படின்னு சொல்லி அனுப்பிச்சிடுவாங்க இங்க வந்து ஒரு ரெண்டு நாள்ல திருமணம் ஆகலைன்னா ஊரே ஒரு மாதிரி பார்க்கணும் ஒரு வாரம் கழிச்சு திருமணம் ஆகலைன்னா இந்தியா கூட நியூஸ் பண்ணக்கூடும் இந்த மாதிரி ஒரு அம்மா இங்க இருக்காங்க அவங்களுக்கு திருமணமே ஆகாம ஒரு வாரம் ஆயிடுச்சு அப்படின்னு சொல்லி இந்த மாதிரி ஒரு காலகட்டம் அப்படி இருந்திருக்கு அதுலேயும் அதையும் மீறி பல பெண்மணிகள் வந்து இங்கே வாழ்ந்து பல சக்சஸஸ் எல்லாம் பார்த்துருக்காங்க and there was no privacy of any kind it was in the middle of all this that women were giving birth women were falling ill women had periods women had so many other problems all of which they bore and then they had the ship's hands who were not the most moralistic of people who thought that any woman who was traveling was available to them there were pirates there was disease there was shipwreck everything was managed and finally at the end of 6 months they would arrive over here The Gwilym is land, on arrival over here, there was no harbour. So the ships would stop two miles in the sea and rafts would then go and receive all these guests. They would be loaded onto the backs of the oarsmen. And then they would have to climb down, they would sit in the Katimaram and then the Katimaram would row them ashore. So this is how it was done. You can see in this picture, there is actually a woman who is being borne by two men and she is being brought to the shore. She is holding on to an umbrella above her head. And those two men over there, I can move my cursor to show it to you if you want. Put it onto the show. So, for all the masses, all the people, they never know that they are couple. They are going to marry them. 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 ஸோ இந்த மாதிரி இதெல்லாம் மீறி தான் இந்த பெண்மணிகள் இங்கே வந்திருக்காங்க அன்ஃபார்ச்சுனேட்லி ஃபார் அஸ் வி டோன்ட் ஹேவ் அ சிங்கிள் பெயிண்டிங் ஆர் அ எனி விஷுவல் ரெப்ரஸன்டேஷன் ஆஃப் லேடி எலிசபெத் வில்லியம் அண்ட் மேரி சாண்டர்ஸ் இட் இஸ் ஸோ ஐரானிக் த டூ விமென் ஹூ டிட் ஸோ மச் ஆஃப் பெயிண்டிங் அண்ட் தேர் லெட்டர்ஸ் வென் யூ ரீட் வென் யூ சி தி இமேஜஸ் 
the words are interspersed with so many sketches. This is a fish. This is how the Indian banana looks when it is on a tree. Everything is done in pen and ink along with the flow of the letter itself. Such wonderful visual representations but we don't have any idea how they looked. But they were not the only women writers of that time. We did have a few. So this is Emily Eden who was the sister of the Governor General Lord Auckland in the 19th century. She was a prolific letter writer and she has written about their travels in North India. Her sister Fanny Eden in my opinion, it was a little more humorous than what Emily was, but both are very good writers. Then we had Julia Maitland, who lived in Madras, the wife of a businesswoman here, who documented her life. And then we had Fanny Parks, who travelled all over India just by herself, and she documented herself, her life as well. So we did have a few examples of women who travelled. Now, but nobody is like Elizabeth Willem and Mary Simons. Just look at the sample of the letters. That is why Lady Elizabeth Willis with an insect drawn, sorry, with a flower drawn on that side. This is Mary Simon's drawing banana planted to illustrate because in England nobody has seen all these things. At that point of time, there was no question of exporting this fruit, the fruit lasting all the way, traveling six months and then landing up over there in banana rods. The first fruit to rot in delivery is the banana, as we all know. And here she has just drawn it. And you should read the description of this particular letter of the banana tree. Even if we have never seen one in our lives, just by reading that letter, you will get a complete idea as to how the tree looks from the time it takes root, how what happens to it, then the size of the leaves, how the fruits come out in cluster, the banana flower, and most importantly, in weddings and festivals, how we use it for decoration. In the what you can ask, what you cannot ask, 
what are their personal habits and there is even a fascinating description of a palanquin bearer who is so particular about his personal appearance that every time he puts down the palanquin he fishes out the dinner and begins squeezing his eyebrows, plucking the hair from his ear, everything is documented by the <laughs> sister. So they, they go down to that kind of a, a detail. So, in the even the war tale of the even the our the world till a funny point of the ethan a pair is done younger than the other pair. No, really, car will come in the winter. In the old and ready pair of the Nabla Samali to the lay of the Varanga, Poranga, Epa Varanga, and the lay, Aditha Valley, Epa, no pair is the company of the winter. Our the over three and a valley for Ninanga are the Yilda Me of the Lord has a letter there is another. The other great request that they keep sending back to their family members in England is dresses. Because there were no samples over here, they had no idea what the latest fashions in London were. And every time a new English woman arrives over here, they are beginning to worry whether she is going to come with a new set of fashions which they don't have because it's more than one year since they received the last consignment from home. And uh, you can see that there is a six month gap between the letter being written here and the letter reaching them. By which time another letter has come from there. So whatever these people have asked for, those people don't know. And they have sent something else. And then yet another letter goes from here saying, no, no, you sent me all this, fine, thank you very much. But this is what I want. And so another six months. So at the end of two years, they get what they really want. And so that is the difference of time. Today, you know, email, WhatsApp, uh, you know, how come you didn't see my message which I sent you last night? What have you been doing, etc., etc. And the other great, you know, the, the suspense that they have in their life, every time uh, the, the announcement comes that a mail packet has come, on one side they are very happy, the other side they are filled with tension because they don't want to know if any relative is dead, about any illness in any family member, and every time they write about it and they say that, you know, the moment we opened the letter, we were so relieved to know six months ago that all of you are alive and well. We don't know what's happened in between in those six months. And then slowly you begin to read of, you know, babies dying, you know, children not being well, people growing old, all that. It's, it's very sad too. They're, they're very lonely over here. But at the same time, they rejoice in these letters. At the same time, they're also quite worried about it. கடிதங்கள்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்ாலும்
So, uh, in the north, for instance, we keep reading about the Englishmen taking babies, uh, Muslim women becoming the mistresses of uh, Englishmen, and we only read once again about the highest strata of society. So, we are looking at General Claude Martin, uh, we are looking about Sir Arthur Octavloni, we are looking like, about people like that at the top end of the spectrum. We have no idea as to what is happening to the soldiers, how they are managing as far as the women or their biological needs were concerned, shall I put it that way. And this is where she writes about the ayahs who come to take care of the babies and she's done this sketch of a baby, though she was childless herself, so she's obviously seen this in someone else's house. And so there is the baby sleeping on the cot and there is the ayah who is seated down below next to the baby. She's full of praise for the behavior of the ayahs and the amount of love and affection they, they shower on the child or on anybody who falls sick. But what is very disturbing is apparently at that time the women were just sold to the soldiers. The soldier would enjoy the woman, enjoy it with inverted quotes, leave her with the child and then abandon her. And she had two options. She could then get sold to someone else or she could become an ayah in a household. So this was the way that the Dalit women were actually living at that point of time. And she, she talks about an ayah who she says, uh, so, you know, she asked her, why did you not, what happened? So then she tells her the whole story of how she was with one soldier. Then she was with another soldier who left her with a baby. She says, even now, some of your upper class servants come and tell me that they are willing to send me to some other soldier. Because I am still young, I am, you know, people are interested in me. But what is the point in going there, Amma? Because thereafter I cannot see my child. My child is my entire life to me. That man will come, he will enjoy me, he will give me some money and then he will go away. After that, what do I do? But my child, I have to take care of my child and that is the reason why I am in your employment. Just see the thread by which the lives are just hanging, you know, and we have, we have never read these things in any other documentation. The first time, this is why a woman's perspective becomes so very important. And a woman who is, shall I put it, not upper upper class, but upper middle class on the border of the upper class with a very sensitive eye towards what is happening to the servants and how they are being treated. See, the same letter is talks about the behavior of the British middle class women in Madras, how they flaunt their wealth, and the same letter also talks about the caste system in India. So it's very ironic because she is describing one form of gradation in society, and she's looking down upon you know women who are uh, new age and who are trying to flaunt their husbands well, British women. The other side, she is indicting the caste system. Then she makes a very valid point. She says, in our society, we can overcome these things by marriage or whatever it is. But in their society, they are condemned to occupy a position by virtue of their birth. She's observed that. And she's writing about it very, very clear, very sensitive uh, uh, noting of people. Of course, while Elizabeth Willis is spending her time noticing people, I'm going to tell you a little more about her. Her sister, Mary, begins to write home about the parties that they attend, about the various people whom they meet and the buildings that they see at that point of time in the city. This was their house in Santo I have no idea where this house is. How the word is Santo the word of the Padama Hotel. But then this house was obviously in Santo at that point of time. She then draws the English or Muriyu, telling the Tamil, Muriyu fire part. So, Angile and Vilipandi, Yavanda, I'm going to face a Muriyu, I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire And Rendebet to me in the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the Muriyu fire part. I'm going to go to the so this man was obviously battening on the fact that neither of the transacting parties knew the language of the other party. The Englishman had no idea what the shopkeeper was talking, shopkeeper had no idea what the Englishman was saying. So these Dubashis became exceedingly wealthy people. Now while Mary is focusing on human beings and buildings and meeting up with people, Elizabeth is spending her time 
drawing birds. And there are more than 120 birds, as Debbie mentioned in her introduction, of birds of Madras. And she must have been completely unique because at that time we have been, there is no other record of an English woman of this kind who was drawing like this and who was, and she must have been working 10 to 12 hours a day. There is no doubt about it because she says, She's so sensitive about the birds. See, Audubon, when he began documenting birds 20 years later, they would shoot the bird. And then the bird would be brought down and then they would draw it. So still life, basically. But Elizabeth insists on the birds being alive, the first thing. Secondly, if they are brought and kept in captivity, they won't eat. So they shouldn't starve also. So she has to finish drawing them within three to four hours so that the birds can be released once again. So these were all live study. She has not killed a single bird in the process of doing her drawing. And if at the end of four hours the sketch was not over, the sketch will have to wait till another bird of the same kind is brought in and then the sketch would be completed. And they were live. So you can imagine, you can't say, You can't say all these things. The bird is a live thing. And she was drawing them and she says, and Mary says, she refers to Elizabeth as Betsy. She says, Betsy has been drawing from the morning and there are people standing in line with samples which they have brought because they know that there is one crazy Memsai who is going to pay you money for every bird that you are bringing. And she is going to be sketching it and she says the whole house is full of dead bird skin. So obviously some people have been skinning birds and bringing them also. But this was the level of detailing and, the, and every bird has got its name written down on it by the side and she was keeping them. Now, the, when the paintings had to be sent back to England, there was a problem because there, was, there could be shipwrecks, as many as 50 paintings vanished in one of them. Her husband, Sir Henry, then said, you have to employ two native painters who will copy every painting that you do. So they actually made two critiques at that time. But I'm on this. In you say for the cloud, you say for the government, so probably other 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 day on the party camp. So then they pair put it with the Avangaman, the Yoga Vare, a part of the Nagaret. Upon a couple of Arsona, Kodaki, and Abuna and Nagaret, and Sutana, the London and Poise, they don't take an ambient elephant. So this was the uh, level of detailing and then flowers. So at that time, Mary is, I mean, Elizabeth is just not a woman who is going to be drawing flower birds. She wants to also get on with other things, so she learns Telugu. She, because she says, that's the only way I can deal with the servants. I need to know what language they are talking. She becomes exceedingly fluent in Telugu because Mary is writing in her letter that Betsy has now become very fluent in the Jeju language. So this woman in the eight years has not only been painting, She's also been learning Telugu and she, she, she says that I need to, you know, she talks about the birds and she talks about the flowers and all that. She says, I need to understand the local context in which these birds are and these flowers are. So I have to know the language. Look at the hunger for getting information, for getting knowledge. She could have just remained at home, the wife of a successful judge or, you know, he had a good salary to do and a very bad tempered man from whatever we can read over there. Sariyana Pushudu. Because as she writes herself that you know, he is a very, uh, he is not of a gentle temperament. That's the mildest line that she uses about her husband. And he's forever complaining. He's got prickly heat all over his body. On one day, some boiling oil or something falls on his leg. He's got problems 24 by 7. And he can't get along with other people in his work. He's one real bad tempered specimen. So she, I think, increasingly focuses on these things to just cut herself off from what is happening in Sir Henry Quillen's life. And he had no teeth apparently, so it's quite a... He was only 45 and he had no teeth. I don't know, but in those days, dental history was also bad, as we all know. So, this is all there. Now, there was Dr. J James Anderson. He is considered to be the father of botany in India because he began the first botanical garden, which is in which was in Nungamba, where we have Anderson's Road, Moore's Road and all that. So that is where the first botanical garden of India began. He is buried in the St. Mary's Island Cemetery on the island and now there is a tree growing out of this tombstone. So it's broken the tombstone into several pieces but it's the best memorial for a botanist. 
when you all have a dream to come up on it. This is a very good spot. But uh, James Anderson becomes a very close friend of Lady Elizabeth Willis. She goes to his house to learn botany and to learn about the various plant species of India. So, Shedi Shedala Mathi Amala Kathakarata. India is the real, Shedi Shedala Mathi Amala Kathakarata. Why do they use it? Amma Kho Utti Valli Kathakarata. Inge Edi Enna Etta Anpraang Amala London. This is a very good idea. But where she gives some Indian oil. She says, you try this, this is very good and you will really benefit from it. And then, the John Johan Rottler, who is a French, I think it's not Johan, it's something else, Rottler, was a French priest who comes to Madras and he's also a botanist and between the two of them they have a long collaboration, Lady Elizabeth and Rottler. Rottler Street is there even now in Bepe. It's named after him. And he identifies this plant species that she has drawn and he gives it the name Willemia in her honour. It is then sent to England for approval but when, they, when, when it reaches there they realise that it's a common genus and it already has a name. So the name is not officially recognized thereafter, but she almost had a plant species named after her and this is the one that she's drawn and she's written the name of the plant species in Telugu behind So she knew how to write Telugu is what we realized from this particular drawing. The, the one very strange thing about Lady Elizabeth Willen is her love for Chennai weather. So, she doesn't complain about the heat at all. Guru Bhakna or Ashmeti Kepa Pata or Thale Lendu Kaab Lengke Vair Guru Vengil Kati 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 Dev Kya Rindha Amma Anna Dana Aprila Ohtu Me Enne Pramada Maarke Chennai Apti Dhe Dhe Lange. You can Chennai Lada Irindha Kaal Nilgi Nishtha Irindha Kaal Nama Theri Yandhi Lhe Dhe Lengar Laa Pati Chaa. Aungi Shodra Vengi Mari Inge Vandhi Edo Uru Rengi Moon Maasa Kunche Vengi Lengi Kethi Uru Mari Kunche Suda Kaap Dhe Rata Anna Time Lada Yella Jennal Kadal Yella Bhe Tharandhe Vachin Thungi Na Ohtu Problem Me Anna Kethi Lengi so she's got a, I think she just decided that she has to come here and be happy. And uh, she also writes about how she orders for a fireplace and fire tongs in Chennai. What she was doing with it, I don't know. But they live in Santo and then they frequently go to Pammal. This is a, a, a house in Pammal which they take on rent and they go and live there. And she says, Pammal, St. Thomas Mount, these are all places that they go and live in when they need a break. And she says the temperature in St. Thomas Mount is 5 degrees lower than what it is in San Tome at that point of time. And she finds it far more uncomfortable and conducive to her. A very positive attitude to her life. This is Mary's sketch of the house in San Tome where they live. Again, a sketch of the boatmen, fishermen bringing the fish at the end of a day's catch on the marina. You can see all the boats at the back. One thing which they managed to do, which any no Englishman could have ever done, is they managed to go to the harem or the seraglio of the Nawabs of Arcot. The Begums of Arcot invite them to come and to meet up with them, so they go there. They get a very clear idea about the private life of the women in a Muslim nobleman's family, and they are able to document that. At the same time, they write about the atrocious treatment of the servants by the women. She says that the women look very nice, they are very beautifully dressed and all that, but you should see the way they beat the servants and she is able to document that as well. She comes to her best when she describes the Kapali Swaran temple procession in 1809. The procession is going to happen six days from now and she has seen it in 1802. And I will just read out the, a small section of it before I come to the last few uh, slides of my presentation. She says, there is even today, Patthinal, Mokhrudeya, Chitre Utsavama, Nika Mokhrudeya, Chitre Thirvila, Mani, Inge Panguni Thirvila, Kapali Swarar Kovila. Adha, Aunga, Yeranu Thirvila, Thirvila, Varsha, Vinaadi Pathar Kamil. Adha, Oda Varna Nere Edhira. Oru-oru nalu ratri boi wagen itu swami beri dia berdaya amna pasal jangka ada apa dia itu dengan itu dia erat itu dia itu rendah macam mana dia ini ini kita nampak pasal korang itu baru baru tak baru pun tu pasal ni terus ada ada orang apa yang pasal jangka. Al she she describes and she says that she talks about how the deities are the houses are all illuminated with innumerable such lamps until it's the blaze of light. The great square at San Tome is about the size of Lincoln's in fields. One side of this is a wall enclosing the pagodas, which, is a, which are very handsome in appearance, and the other three sides are Brahmini houses with frequent openings into the countryside. 
And then, in order to see this side reason, so she talks about the Rishabhavakana festival because she is talking about a midnight procession. And that is only on the fifth day when Swami comes out in the middle of the night in procession. In order to see this site, we set out about half past ten o'clock, having three miles to go. The roads were crowded with men, women, and children coming from all parts. We went to a chowdhury in the street near the square, before which chowdhury there was a panda erected, it being near to the entrance of the pagoda from whence the gods were to set out. They brought us sweets and fruit, garlands of flowers of a kind of white jasmine around our neck, and from a silver ewer sprinkled out handkerchiefs with rose water giving each of us a ball of the same flowers as the garlands to hold in our hand. And then she talks about the way the deities were brought in procession, the way the Devadasis danced in front of the deities, and the way the camphor was lit and named, and how everybody wanted to get a little bit of the camphor. Every little bit of description is there. Then, of course, you have plenty of these buildings like the, you know, the Dastaki Sari, Dargha, which is in Maila Port. The way they go around to various mosques in this place and they document that also. What happens eventually to Lady Elizabeth Willett is that you find that between 1801 and 1805, the letters are very happy, very positive, bubbling with joy, but always there is this undercurrent of troubles that Sir Henry is having in his job all the time. In 1806, the whole thing comes to a head because Sir Henry goes completely against the local governor, Lord William Bentley and the Chief Justice of Madras, Sir Thomas Strange. And finally, he is dismissed as a judge of the, high, uh, of the Supreme Court of Madras. In 1807, around the time of his dismissal, we find that the letters have come to a complete halt. And there is no mention of Elizabeth falling ill in any of the letters that Mary is sending out back to England. But Elizabeth's letters have, considering that she was writing 10,000 words in every letter, Suddenly, the fact that the letters have come to a call is a little puzzling to us. And then she dies in 1807 at the age of 44 and is buried in, Fort, in St. Mary's Church in Fort St. George. Her husband's dismissal order comes in October and then next year he goes back accompanied by his sister-in-law. There is Polly or Mary Simons. Mary falls in love with the captain of the ship and eventually marries him. And uh, because Sir Henry Willett has been suspended, he doesn't get a pension. He later fights for getting his pension and he gets it eventually. He marries again and lives up to a very ripe old age. My theory is that Elizabeth Willett, because she just loved this place, I think she wanted to be here forever. And eventually when she died here, it's very appropriate that this woman is buried here and has remained in the city which she really loved. And uh, the paintings themselves appear to have had a very unique history. We don't know what happened to them. But in 1920, they were discovered in a second-hand art dealer shop in England. And from there, they made their journey to the United to Canada, where they are now in the McGill University. That is Elizabeth Willett's paintings. Mary Simon's sketches are in Norwich in the Southeast Asian collection, South Asian collection. And that is where they remain. They are both exceedingly unique women, no uh, you know, doubts about that and they bring us a very very unique perspective of India which is completely lacking in otherwise East India company records and writings. Thank you very much.